When you look at religion in these modem days and times with all of the advanced technology, most of what were miracles in the Bible and the Quran, scientists are performing in laboratories today. For instance, controlling the weather, the immaculate conception or birth without two partners, the altering of molecules, hovering in the air, the resuscitation or bringing people back who had died, and I can go on. So you have to look and see what purpose does religion play in the world today. Let's take a look at just what religion breeds, racism, hatred, separation, ignorance, and war. In fact, you cannot name a conflict in the world that does not involve religion and the millions upon millions of innocent people that die in the crossfire. Just take a look at the Muslim world and how they justify terrorism in the name of Allah and the Quran. Look how the Jewish world, the Zionist movements and how they justify terrorism in the name of their God, as well as the many Christian countries. They are all involved in the same thing. The bombing of Hiroshima and Nagasaki and many other massacres were done in the name of Christianity. In China and in Korea millions are massacred in the name of Buddhism. Also in India, millions and millions are murdered daily. And in the name of the Hindu gods. Each religion or group feels that they have the right to own God and that their particular religion and religious practices are right and everybody else is wrong. It is a very narrow-minded way to think because no one is always right and no one is always wrong. Thus, everybody else is a goy, Hebrew word for Gentile, as it is referred to in Leviticus 26:45. but I will for their sakes remember the covenant of their ancestors whom I brought forth out of the land of Egypt in the sight of the, goy, heathen that I might be their God, I am the Lord. A Gentile or a Kafir, a disbelieving infidel, Quran 2:34, chapter 109, or whatever name other religions use, what people who are not of their particular persuasion are called, thus justifying killing them. For instance, write in the New Testament in Matthew 15 26, and I quote, But he, Jesus, answered and said it is not meet to take the children's bread and to cast it to canarian, dogs, where Jesus refers to a woman as a dog. In the Quran 560 and 265 in part, and they said to them, Be ye karata, apes, disposed and rejected. Where Allah turns people into apes and khanzir, swine, because they were not of the same religion and didn't keep the religious laws of that group, I think it is very sad when religious people will accept a God that has reduced himself to calling people names. Religion refuses to acknowledge scientific evidence about how old the planet is and how long man has been in existence. Religion has created their own calendars to alter time. So what is God? God is anyone or thing in control of other beings or things to be. God does not make you the all for God is within the all. The person who was assigned to you was Tamu son of Ishtar and Damuzi. Tammuz was once a disagreeable Elohim before being converted to agreeable. They called Dumuzi, the father Osiris. His wife Ishtar in ancient Egypt was known as Isis, and their son Tammuz was known as Horus. She was called by the ancient Greeks Aphrodite which means lust, she was the goddess of love and beauty in Greek mythology. From which you get the word aphrodisiac meaning something that lures people sexually. So Tammuz was assigned to oversee you and be your El Elo for 6,000 years, he tried to telepathically communicate with you. I'm talking about Tammuz, Jesus Christ, Horus tried to telepathically communicate to his children whom he is responsible for on earth. The Elohim from Agarda also called Ashara, the underworld, came and got Tammuz and brought him down to the underworld to convert him to an agreeable Elohim. However, his mother Ishtar went to the underworld and tried to kidnap him because she knew Tammuz would be converted from disagreeable to agreeable. Even though Ishtar broke the seven seals to the underground world, she was captured by Arishkigal, wife of Nergal, the ruler of the underworld. Later Ishtar escaped leaving her lover and her son Tammuz behind. There were two Horus. Horus is always depicted as a child sitting in his mother Isis, whose real name is Aset, lap breast feeding. And then that would be Ishtar and Tammuz. Tammuz was called Adonis, Adonai, meaning master, lord and became your god. This is the very same depiction of the blessed mother Mary and Jesus. Thus they are all the same people, just different versions and times. Let me repeat myself, they are the same people. The story just changed as it was retold from place to place. Thus making Tammuz, Horus and Jesus Christ the same person. The Egyptian Horus is equivalent to Christ. That's why it is said that Horus is Christ-like. This is the same Tammuz that your Bible speaks about in Ezekiel 8 14. The word Tammuz means source of life or sprout of life. Ezekiel 8 14, Then he came to me at the door of the gate of Yahuwah's house which was upon the north. And there, right over there sat down a female living beings weeping for Tammuz, the sprout of life. Tammuz, Jesus Christ, Horus tried to telepathically communicate to his children whom he is responsible for on earth by creating groups like Jehovah's Witnesses, Massontology, Seventh-day Adventists the Nation of Islam. All of these are forms of Christianity, believe it or not. 
all of these religions are trying to speed up and get you out of that old time religion, as it is called, that old Christian concept. To the non-holding steadfast, that Southern Baptist Church you gather on Sunday together with a tambourine and sing and you wait for Jesus. When you became a Christian you got caught in a time zone. That was your mistake. Whether you know it or not, you stopped functioning 2000 years ago. You base everything on events that took place around 2000 years ago. You claim that's when God came, and then you go on to claim that he's coming back. You walk around in churches not going any further or making any real progress because you're waiting for his return. However, the pastor and the elder whom you put your faith in keep you bound to the church because he keeps saying we are progressing. But what they don't tell you is that it is impossible to progress with a 2000 year old religion and if you think your preachers don't know this then you are fooling yourselves. Religion is an escape from reality and the tool of the weak. What I mean by this is, religion keeps you aspiring for a place called heaven which is intangible. And there are no guarantees that you are going there and what is even more heartbreaking is that you will have to die or you will have to go through trials and tribulations before you can go there. Millionaires and successful people are not religious people. For example, Michael Jackson was a Jehovah's Witness until he became a millionaire because of the many restrictions of the religion, he couldn't continue to be a member. Michael realized that he would have been able to make millions of dollars and live as comfortable as he wanted. And as you can see he is still a millionaire without being a devout Jehovah's Witness. So what does that say about the God of the Jehovah's Witnesses? In the case of the Israelites, Jews and Hebrews or Seventh-day Adventists, Pentecostals, Catholics and other Christians groups or the Mohammedans, Muslims, Muslims by whatever sect or anything you want to call yourselves, are caught in a 1400 year time zone. You're living back 1400 years, missing reality, ignoring advancement as well as developments. You are pretending that you don't see all of these scientific discoveries and archaeological findings. You're doing what the people did 1400 years ago, in the case of a Muslim. The only difference is now you are calling it the Sunnah or traditions. But in reality, it's their way of life, meaning desert Arabs of 1400 years ago who lived in the Arabian Peninsula. Now here you are living in America in the 20th century like you're in some kind of movie setting out of the Arabian Nights. The sooner you let go of the past and that way of life and catch up with time, the better off you're going to be. You're caught back there 1400 years and won't progress. There isn't much a 2000 year old religion like Christianity can do for you, not to mention Judaism that is 6000 years old and people are parading around masquerading. They are locked in a time zone and believe me I know because I lived in that same time warp. But it's not fair to the children being born to these fanatics. It just messes up their lives and makes things difficult for them. It cuts them off from reality and deprives them of a normal childhood. As you can see all your Arabs from whatever Arab country, whether it is Saudi Arabia, Egypt, Somali, Sudan, Syria, Kuwait, Jordan, Iraq, Turkey or any other country, all had to come over here to America. And I mean all of their religious leaders and political leaders come to the United States of America by way of England in order to get infidel as they call it, technology, to move forward. They buy technology from the Japanese, they buy technology from the Germans, they buy technology from America. Because 1400 years ago, when the Prophet Mustafa Muhammad al-Amin, who was born in the year 570 AD and gave birth to the Muhammadan religion and gave them his family idol Allah which later became known as Allah, he wrote their holy book, the Quran, copying from the Christian's Bible which they call Al-Anjil and the Jewish Bible which they call it Torah and made up their newly found sect of Catholicism now called Islam, but submerged it into the Arabian culture of that day being 1400 years ago, they are locked there. And if they attempt to advance or improve it's called innovation. They are classified as someone trying to change their traditions and this person or persons will be put to death and called a munafik a hypocrite or a kafira ona, disbeliever. Thus they are trapped. When you walk down the street today and see a Sunni Muslim, whether he's Sunni, Shiite or whatever sect he belongs to, they are walking around in America with turbans, tajias, kamizas and jalabias like they did 1400 years ago. He is locked in a 1400 year time zone. The Honorable Elijah Muhammad knew what he was talking about when he said you have to bring it up to date. But now his ideas are outdated and must be brought up to date. Now Minister Louis Farrakhan and the many other groups that broke off from them are also in a time lock. You are walking around dressed like people dressed in the 30s. They need to be updated, it's just about when and how. Meaning, you can't abruptly make changes because if you put a bunch of people in bow ties who don't want to be in bow ties, as soon as they get mad, they take off the bow ties and grow a beard. As in the case when the Honorable Elijah Muhammad died and his son Wallace D. Muhammad took over. It didn't take long before they changed their clothes and forgot all about what they were being taught. That's not right. Again you got caught in a time zone. Now take your Egyptologists. 
they're caught anywhere between a 2000 year and a 5000 year time zone. You have the people who are into Egyptology who are walking around with huge over exaggerated anks, dashikis and bones in their noses. There isn't anything wrong with wearing an ankh on your neck or a cross, but Negroes have the tendency to over exaggerate. You don't have to wear an ankh bigger than your chest. You don't have to overdo it. If you're a Rastafarian and you acknowledge Emperor Haile Selassie as a god and savior to you, and it benefits you spiritually then it is good for you, in that you decide to wear dreads, that is your culture. That is good for you. At least it's within a 100 year time frame. Meaning you're within 100 years of information. At least the leadership you're worshipping is 100 years up to date. But now it's time to update your information and doctrine. You just can't stay that way forever. The general information of the Orthodox Muslims hasn't changed. That means that 1400 years of research and information has changed. If they decide to stay in this dead religion called Judaism, Christianity, Islam, Buddhism, Hinduism and in other isms you can think of, means they will have to ignore reality. By this I mean, there have been archaeological finds dating back millions of years proving there was life before 6,000 years ago according to Judaism, 2,000 years ago according to Christianity and 1,400 years ago according to Islam. Do you follow what I'm saying? The information that was passed down 1,400 years ago was good for the people 1,400 years ago and for those people who lived in that time period. I give more respect to the Rastafarians who acknowledge Haile Selassie as the Lion of Judah and the conquering Lion Savior. I will respect that quicker than I would somebody who was back 5,000 years ago and can't come up to reality but will get on the subway, will get on the bus, and will drive a car. Excuse me Mr. Muslim, but where is your camel? Where are your donkeys, Christians? You say Jesus is the way, the truth and the light, no one gets to the Father but by him, which meant you must emulate everything Jesus did, John 14 6. Jesus rode on a donkey. I want to see some donkeys at churches. I want to see some donkeys there on Sunday morning in front of the cathedral or the chapel. Don't you? I want you on donkeys because if you are not on a donkey or ass then you are not following Jesus Christ to the letter. I want you Mohammedans on camels. The Prophet Muhammad rode into Medina on a camel. I want some camels in front of your mosque on Friday. Egyptians rode on everything from a camel to llamas, to horses. If you don't intend on following Jesus or Muhammad to the letter then don't pick and choose the days and times that you feel like it. Don't jump up to 1994 AD, and then when you get mad at society go back to religion. You're trapped in a time zone. It's time to shake off all that stupidity and catch up to where you were and get a move on. There are people who are trapped in time zones and will stand on the comer and argue with you saying, Brother the Prophet Muhammad. You'll say Mustafa Muhammad al-Amin, him? Yeah. When was he born? In the year 570 AD, when did he die? The year 632 AD that's 1400 years ago. What are you doing now? We follow his sunnah, the Quran. There is none, there is no redemption for your sin. There is not a place in the Quran where it talks about redemption for your sin. It talks about what's going to happen to you if you don't do right over and over. But it doesn't give one clue to redemption other than you follow the Prophet Muhammad. And Muhammad died 1400 years ago and you're still following Muhammad, partially. Quran 4 to 140, and indeed, he sent down towards you all, in the Quran, so when you hear the sources signs, verses of the Quran being concealed and mocked at, don't sit with those enocytes, who concealed the truth about the Quran, until they enter unto other terms, except the sources hadith, the Quran. If you do this, indeed you would be like them. Surely, Allah will gather all the hypocrites, those who were Muslims, then turn back, and all those who concealed what they know to be the truth, together in hell, Jahannam. Mohammedans are not eating what the Prophet Muhammad ate because if you study your hadith it tells you what Muhammad ate. And it definitely was not pizza and soda so Sunni Muslims should not be eating pizza or drinking Coca-Cola or smoking cigarettes. Quran 2 to 219, they ask you Muhammad, about intoxicants and the drawing of lots, gambling. Tell them, both of them, intoxicants and gambling, are a big sin, and benefits for the Enocytes. And both, intoxicants and gambling, their sin is bigger than their benefits. And they ask you Muhammad, as to what they should be sharing willingly. Say, whatsoever can be spared, the source makes the signs clear for you all, so that perhaps you all will think. There were no cigarettes or beer, and to take it to another level, there were no Rolex watches, Chanel no, five perfume or Italian loafers. None of you are supposed to be walking around with synthetic fabric, nor candy, nor ice cream, nor potato chips, nor barbecue, nor potato salad. Do you know how many things you would have to give up to say you really follow the Prophet Muhammad to the letter? We were, as the Ansars, the nearest to it. Now, 
Do you see how ridiculous it is for you to stay locked in this abode of dead information called religion? We were as ansars walking around freezing our butts off in sheets and sneezing through veils. Now you're walking around talking about you're on the right path. The only thing you don't know is the path started 1400 years ago and it stopped in the year 632 AD, which is 1400 years ago. The moment Muhammad stopped breathing and giving you fresh information, you died. The moment anything stops functioning it's dead. All you're doing now is going over dead information. That's what I was trying to tell you about the nation of Islam. I was saying what they were doing for the people was beautiful. But now, every time I listen to a Savior's Day on tape, I'm hearing the same information. I'm hearing what the Honorable Elijah Muhammad said, and that was good for the 1930s even 40s. But now it's stale information, about what the white devils have done to us and how we're going to get revenge. And how God came exclusively for a handful of us if we shave off all of our hair and wear a bow tie. Now listen, if God came to you in the physical person in the year 1930 AD and we are now still in the same condition, still being oppressed, still being held back, have not risen to our glory as gods and rulers as you teach, still on welfare, we're not immune to AIDS and I can go on, then we didn't need that God. He didn't do anything for you or for anybody. If God comes for you nothing and nobody could hurt you, let alone hurt him. So it's that old slave, blame it on the white man mentality that they're living in which keeps their followers from getting up and doing for themselves. But they, like the Christians, are waiting for God to come back in some form or fashion to save them while they blame all their misfortunes and shortcomings on the Caucasians that's living in a time lock. You have to start moving up onto the next step where we are now. In the case of the Mohammedans 1400 years ago, they didn't have televisions yet. So now you have to move up to that level for the safety and sake and intellectual security of your children in the future. All of these things were done through calendars and time to make you unable to link back to your people. If we say Adam and Eve were 49,000 years ago, 49,000, basing it on the seven figure of Psalm 9010, a book in the Old Testament, as well as 2 Peter 3 8, a book in the New Testament, then that is a time zone in the Old Testament time. Psalm 9010, the days of our years are seventy years and if by reason of strength they be eighty years, yet is there trouble labor and sorrow, for it is soon cut off and we fly away. 2 Peter 3 8, but do not ignore this very important thing that one day to the master is a thousand years and a thousand years is as one day. When talking about Christianity, you'll have to go your four thousand four years. If you want to step out of the Old Testament and go to where the Old Testament came from, the Atrahasis, Enuma Elish and the Gilgamesh epics, you will leave the 49,000 years, and be up 4,900,000 years, 4,900,000. You'll either say that the planet was formed 24 billion years ago or 24,000 years ago. How many sixes are in there? You see it right there. 6 plus 6 plus 6 plus 6 equals 24. This is equivalent to, June which is the 6th month, the 6th day of the month in the year 1966. June 6, 1966 is the birth date of the Antichrist. In the year 1966 AD the devil gave birth to 13 children. His sons are in every country that he controls being Germany, Iran, India and China to name a few, all over the world. 1979 AD was his year of the child or when they became 13 years of age. 6 plus 6 plus 6 plus 6 equals 24, 6666. They're playing a number game and they know about the calculation of the Sumer. What I mean by this is, that mathematicians know about the Sumerian doctrine which was an ancient extraterrestrial land. The Sumerian year is 24,000 years long which ties into the moon and sun cycles which are equivalent to 24,000 years also because it is broken up into four sets of 6,000 years. They know about the first mathematicians because they are finding out that these people calculated the distance of the planets. A primitive tribe in Mali, West Africa called the Dogon tribe know of these astronomical and astrological facts. They know the distance of the planets and the star constellations and how many stars are there. They had star maps and high mathematics. The six-pointed star is not a Jewish star. The six-pointed star, Mogan David is the symbol of the sun and is found on tablets in cuneiform. It has a circle in the center of it, and has the planets around it. So you can't tell me Mr. Muslim man that a six-pointed star is a Jewish star. You can't tell me that an Islamic star is a Jewish star. The Jewish star nor the Islamic star is the original six-pointed star. It goes all the way back to the Sumerians to the 3rd millennium BC. This carving is located at a museum in East Berlin called the Vordresiastische ATBA Long of the State Museum. This depiction of a group of 11 globes encircling a large, star is clearly a depiction of the solar system as it was known to the Sumerians, a system consisting of 12 celestial bodies. Genesis 15 1, after the Elo did these things, the saying of Yahuwah came unto Abram in his vision, Yahuwah made himself heard, 
saying, Fear not, Abram. I am your Mogan, shield, your reward is exceedingly great. This star is a symbol. It is a symbol of the sun known in Egyptology as Ra. In Genesis 16:14, Hagar called him Amon Ra or El Roy, which means the all-seeing. Genesis 16:14, therefore everybody called the well Bir Laher Roy, well of the living one Ra, who saw me, it is here between Kodesh the holy place and Bered, the place of hail. I'm trying to reach out to all people who are trapped in time zones of poor information. Whether they call themselves Egyptologists or Muslims or Christians or Jews or Buddhists or Hindus. We need to shake them and wake them up. We must say this is not the truth. These are the facts beyond any doubt. You can have some truths that are not facts. There are Muslims that say, this is the truth brother, this is Al-Haq. This is Al-Haq, Aki. Yes, it is true the Prophet Muhammad was born in the year 570 AD. The moment they added AD, they added Christianity to it, Año Dominus. Then they'll say we have to create our own calendar called the Calendar of Islam. And they call it the AH, meaning after the Hijra, after Muhammad migrated in the year 622 AD, Año Dominus. By using AD, again shows that you still need Christianity. Is this allowed according to your religion? If you say you follow the Sunnah of the Prophet Muhammad and there was no such thing as after Hijra, isn't this innovation? This is the time zone problem. We have to untangle this stuff. This is what Ansars were really about from day one. I had to teach you so much Islam that no Muslim can trick you. Whatever language influenced the people of course the culture influenced the people and whatever culture influenced the people, of course the migration for industry, buying and selling takes place there. Then the confusion begins because they say the first language was Akkadian also spelled Akkadian. No the first language was Hebrew. Muslims say the first language was Arabic. The Hindus are saying the Hindi. However, the first spoken language on earth was cuneiform which is the language spoken by the Elohim Anunnaki who brought it to the planet earth. This is why all of those original earth languages can be traced to the scriptures except for cuneiform. They know it's here. They know it existed before the Bible was recorded and they know all the tongues and languages came out of cuneiform. In fact, every script is traced back to cuneiform. Everybody is trying to get anybody to migrate to their own country. That's why it's called to vacation which simply means to vacate one place for another. This of course will create industry in the country migrated to. But what happens is people travel to vacation in foreign countries but end up seeking the luxuries of the West. Even in the heart of Egypt or Saudi Arabia the hotels have to advertise their luxuries. If you look at where and how the Muslim story starts you get their prophet Muhammad being hired by a rich widow named Khadija. Thus the Muhammadan story as you can see shows that Islam was about industry from the beginning. Also they boast about how rich the first Khalifa, successor, to Muhammad was. His name was Abu Bakr Sadiq. They called him Sadiq the Trusted, but they refer to him as the wealthy one. They did not start as a religion. Abraha came from Ethiopia to try to overthrow Mecca. He was a so-called Christian Nubian from Abyssinia. He was the viceroy or king deputy of Yemen. Abraha proceeded to build a cathedral at Sana'a on the hope that it would become the center of worship for all of Arabia. Hindered by the Kaaba in Mecca, Abraha decided to destroy it. He was trying to bring his trade into Mecca and take control of that trade route and city from the Quraysh tribe of which Muhammad was born. Thus, in 570 AD, Abraha set out for Mecca with a large army accompanied by his trained elephant Mahmud. Because the army of invaders were mounted on elephants, this year became known as the Year of the Elephant. A delegate of Meccan chiefs of which Abdul Muttalib, 497-578 AD, the Prophet Mustafa Muhammad al Amin's grandfather, wanted to discuss the matter with Abraha. Abraha wasn't successful in taking Mecca. Abraha died a horrible death. The 105th chapter of the Quran called Surah Al-Fil or the Elephant, was written about Abraha and how the Lord dealt with the companions of the Elephant. Quran 105, Seest thou not how thy Lord dealt with the companions of the Elephant? Did he not make their treacherous plan go astray? And he sent against them flights of birds, striking them with stones of baked clay. Then did he make them like an empty field of stalks and straw, of which the corn, has been eaten up. In Surah Al-Fil, it tells you that the Lord dealt with Abraha by sending birds against him that stoned him with baked clay. What kind of God would make a man a leader by nature just so that he may stone him to death by way of birds? However, the Quraysh were trying to keep control, but their family clan kept breaking up and intermarrying with other clans. Thus they bred a Muhammad to try to unite the clan to keep the trade. This is found in their Quran written by Muhammad. Chapter 106, where it states and I quote, For the covenants, of security and safeguard enjoyed, by the Quraysh, their covenants, covering, journeys by winter and summer, let them adore the Lord of this house, 
who provides them with food against hunger, and with security against fear, of danger. As you can see, this is a prejudice chapter encouraging the Quraysh tribe to keep their prayers and their loyalty to Mecca which they refer to as this house meaning the Kaaba that stands in the center of Mecca. The Kaaba is an object of adoration by Muslims who used to house all of their 360 idols of which the head was a god named Allah as you can see it is the same as the word Allah. This may be heartbreaking to some of you Mohammedans. However, it is my job to tell the facts. Initially, the pilgrimage or what is known as Hajj to Mecca was not intended to be a religious ritual. It was a means of trade. To this day they charge people to make pilgrimage. They sell water from the Zamzam well. Everything about the pilgrimage from plain fare, to hotel, to food, religious articles and artifacts are being sold. This goes all the way down to a man who is hired called a muta wife who recites all the rituals in Arabic for those who can't speak the language which of course is 90% of the Muslim world. And the 10% who can speak Arabic have long since left the religion of Islam. Because with in-depth knowledge of Arabic, it is easy to see the fallacies of the Mohammedan religion. They were trying to bring people from all over the world into one of the biggest scams you can think of. They were trying to get people to come from all over the world to that one spot, because at the time the Meccans were in control of a lot of industry. They were importing spices and other goods from Syria, because remember Khadija, was strictly a businesswoman who didn't many Muhammad because she loved him. Khadija married Muhammad because he was of the Quraysh tribe. He was young and she was able to manipulate him. He was 25 years old and she was 40 when they married. That was all part of the Catholic Church, because she was a Christian. Khadija's family were Christians. The Roman Catholic Church created a new religion which was a combination of Babylonian Jewish and Roman Catholic teachings. The publication also mentions that Khadija, a wealthy widow, donated her wealth to the church and joined a convent. Later they had her leave the convent to find a Muslim man who had charisma and leadership ability. Once Muhammad was picked out, a Roman Catholic teacher by the name of Augustine had to develop a technique to convert Arabs to Catholicism by using Muhammad. Muhammad's spiritual advisor was Waraka bin Nafal, the uncle of Khadija who counseled him in the interpretation of his visions. Waraka was a faithful Roman Catholic which is why he guided Muhammad in giving the Virgin Mary Mother of Jesus, a place of prominence in the Quran of whom the entire 19th chapter is dedicated to. This is one of the chains which links Islam with the Vatican and Christianity. If you do some research, they'll tell you the first place Khadija took Muhammad to be taught was to her uncle, Waraka. His name was Waraka which means paper, because according to them he had the Holy Bible. Do you see the trick? Waraka also taught Muhammad that he was Rajl Allah or the Apostle of Allah. However, he should have told him that he was Rajl Allah. In view of the fact that before the Quran was edited and vowels were added, none of the languages or dialects of the country had vowels. The name Allah can be found today in the Quran 53 19-20. Though they spell Allah and they spell Allah, the root letters Allahu is the same root, and must come from the Hebrew word Elo, which comes from the Babylonian word Elo. They claim the ancient Kufic language was the first language that the Quran script was written in. Kufic was not the first language of the Quran that was spoken. The first language of the Quran that was spoken was the Quraysh dialect, Quran 43-3, because the Quran, Muslims boast was revealed in classical Arabic. It is a lie. The Quran never claimed it had been revealed in classical Arabic. Khadija and Waraka made Muhammad a prophet just like people made Martin Luther King Jr., Marcus Garvey, Elijah Muhammad, etc., into prophets. These leaders weren't divinely inspired. They were motivated by their followers. Nor was Muhammad divinely inspired by Allah. Khadija and Waraka worked on his ego and built him up more and more on untruths. You may ask, how could it be possible for Islam to be a made-up religion conspired by Khadija? Think about it. Why would a rich businesswoman with a prominent family in Mecca and two previous husbands, choose and marry a poor and uneducated man 15 years younger than herself, such as Muhammad? And please don't say it was love. And no, she did not need him for financial support. It was a conspiracy. Look at the distance between their marriage and his call to prophethood a total of 15 years. Do you think she actually supported him all that time with no strings attached? This is one big mess that Khadija, Waraka and the Vatican created and it must be cleaned up once and for all. The pamphlets that the Holy Tabernacle Ministries are publishing will do just that, clean up this mess once and for all. The original Quran was originally written in male, slanting, script. The male script is one of the oldest existing scripts to be used in the Quran. Part of this Quran was copied at Medina in the 8th century. So where is an authentic copy of the original Quran? It does not exist. However, they will lie and say that they have the oldest Quran, giving you the impression that it is the original. Oldest is not original. 
They did not expect for me to read their books in Arabic carefully and find the contradictions and Arabic mistakes in the Quran. The Quran was revealed in the dialect of the Prophet Muhammad, Quran 43-2, 106-1. Muslims say it was in Muhammad's dialect and his dialect was the Quraysh dialect which they say was not the most intelligent dialect. All of the poets did not come out of his tribe. The dots are, when you see the letters bell, and they put a dot on the bottom, when you see the TAA they put two dots on the top. When you see the letter TA, they put three dots you see the letter Jim you see a dot etc. Those dots did not exist in ancient Kufic. So it was almost impossible to differentiate between Be, TAA, and TA, or HA and Jim, or Gim, and Ka, or TA, DHA. It was almost impossible. So with the creation of the letter TAA Marbuta, which is merely a TAA Maftua or an open TAA that is Marbuta, from the root Rabata meaning to tie or a tied TAA. It was no more than the letter Ha. In its ending form with two dots added. Even in the Quran they write out the name Alat, and they write it without the TAA Marbata. They write it with a TAA Maftua, which is the word Fatiha, which means opening. They take an open TAA and call it TAA Maftua. This would not have been here either to differentiate whether that was Allah, a lot, or a lot. So dialect is what destroyed the Quran and if all of these things had to be added to the Quran, that means that the Quran is not by far authentic. If you can walk up to any Sunni at any given time and ask them have you, not your teacher, ever seen the original copy of the Quran in which you put your soul's destiny? Then you can ask them are you a reader? If you are a reader do you know that there is no original copy of the Quran, that all your average copies are copies? Do you know that the script that your Quran the Ka, Lam, Ya, Fa, Tamar Buta are nothing but Persian letters and that the Persians really set up Kufic, because Amir al muminin Ali went to a place called Kufa and he protected the original Quran? Do some research and you'll find out Muslims don't know that they've never seen a copy of the original Quran. Muslims don't know what they are holding in their hands today, whether it's authentic or not. And I'm not talking about the translation. I am not talking about Abdullah Yusuf Ali's verses, Pikthal's verses, Mir Ahmed Ali or the many other mistranslated Qurans. I'm talking about the Arabic Quran that's supposed to have had several different pieces. They have one or two pages, but they don't have any of the original Quran. They have less of the original Quran than was found of the Dead Sea Scrolls of Jewism and Christianism. And they will kill on behalf of religion because it's all about money. Again, they don't even have one true original Quran. So in order to unify everybody through the trade in Mecca, they had to come up with a universal dialect and call it classical. So the best of them got together who was Muhammad's son-in-law, Amir al muminin Ali and his family and took the religion seriously. You read it in their own doctrine or sirah about who was going to become the Khalifa, successor. Muhammad was brought to glory again when they saw a dissension taking place that caused the trade not to center around that dressed up cube called the Kaaba, which translates as cube, like ice cube. They were mainly concerned with people coming to Mecca and circling around their Kaaba. They put 360 idols inside of the Kaaba whether you are aware of it or not. That is no coincidence. That happens to be the same as 360 degrees of knowledge and 360 degrees of the circle they make for each degree that a Muslim makes around the Kaaba called the Taf. He is re-acknowledging 360 idols that were taken out of the Kaaba by the Prophet Muhammad. This proves that Muslims were and still are idol worshippers. And that couldn't have happened if Hamza didn't come along and protect him, because the Meccans were going to kill Muhammad when he set out to destroy the idols inside of the Kaaba. However, Allah allowed Hamza to be struck down and killed at the Battle of Uhud, Quran 320-21, and all his relatives died as well. Hamza was a great warrior which is how he gained his name meaning Lion of Allah. Hamza was the son of Abdul Muttalib who was the grandfather of Muhammad. So they were really interested in bringing people here to make this circle and to keep you there in Mecca for 90 days so that you'll have to buy, trade and sell to survive. However, after Muhammad died, dissension came about. Muhammad's family took the religion which was really a branch of Christianity and Judaism combined together and started going in their own direction. The people who they called Sunnis were not religious at all. They were strictly business. They are still strictly business, it's just that the Negro Sunnis don't know that the people who come from Egypt, Arabia and other foreign countries to America who call themselves being your imams and sheikhs are into money, not saving your poor soul. These men come over here as doctors, lawyers and professors. If you ask the average imam who is a Sunni, not the Negro, I'm talking about the one who came over here from Egypt or Saudi Arabia or Palestine, what are you doing here? He'll say, I'm a student. Walk up to the average Arab you see on the street and say assalamu alaikum they'll say walaikum salam, you ask what are you doing? They'll say I'm a student. What are you studying? They'll say economics, sociology, political, science, chemistry, algebra. 
They study all kinds of science that deal with building the economics of their country, not here in America. They were trying to control the wealth. They even put a whole section in the Quran, chapter 106 about them. They wanted to put a protection on that tribe wherever they traveled. Quran 106 to 1, O tribe of Quraysh, who are descendants of Abraham, you have become accustomed to thousands of Allah's protections. That is the game. So the word Allah could not have existed in the time of the original Quran. It was in the possession of the descendants of Muhammad because neither the TAA or Tamar Buddha existed for they didn't use dots. Go to any library or museum. Look it up and see what they call a page or an out search from the original Quran. So you can go see it. Then go ask them how do you determine Gim from Jim and Gim alone you already messed it up. From Ha, Ta, how do you determine that word? Do you call Khalifa, what is Yalifa, or Galifa, or Alifa? This can be asked because there were many dialects spoken, because Muhammad spoke his dialect, Abu Bekr Sadiq the trusted, spoke his dialect. The Egyptians had their hands on the Quran and they spoke their dialect and then Babylonians, the Persians and the Pakistanis had their hands on it which means that it changed to suit each one of their dialects or tongues and the Pakistanis had a combination of Urdu and Hindi and mixed their dialect in it. Which one is right? Well, one will say the Quraysh dialect and that is where the conflict begins. So are you telling me that the Heavenly Father Allah speaks in your dialect? What an egotistical thing to say. Doesn't he speak in a universal language? Wouldn't the Almighty be able to speak in a scripture that everybody on every part of the planet, under every rock, in every crevice can understand? He doesn't have to reveal a book like this in Hebrew only for the Hebrews or in Greek only for the Greek, let alone in Arabic, the Quraysh dialect, only for a bunch of backward, rock-throwing, cube worshippers. If you say this is the universal religion and the Quran came down for everybody you are putting Allah in a very strange position. You are making him look like he is incompetent because if Allah wants to send a message to all humanity regardless of race, creed or color, and that message is a message of submission and peace, then when he spoke, everybody that he was speaking to would understand him. Otherwise you are saying that he is incapable of speaking to the whole world at one time. Meaning Muhammad would not have been necessary. In fact the Muslim themselves render Muhammad helpless and unnecessary because in the Quran they make the statement Mata Nazru Allahi meaning when is the help coming while Muhammad was standing right there in front of them meaning that Muhammad was no help to them. Quran 2-214, Or have you all calculated that you will enter into the enclosed garden of delight, and there has not come upon you the likeness of what has come upon those children of Israel, who were before you all. They suffered distress, affliction and adversity, and they were so shaken until the one sent Muhammad, and those who were faithful to him said, When will the aid of the source come? However, surely the time for the aid of the source, is near. In the Quran 1933, the Muslims say the Messiah Isa al-Masih or the Messiah Jesus, is going to return. They have this in their hadiths. The Muslims have all kinds of silly writings about the Messiah. Yet, they claim that the Quran was total and complete and that Muhammad was the seal of the messengers and of the prophets. If you seal something up, then you don't need anybody to come after that. If the Quran was totally complete, then you don't need another messenger with another conversation, regardless to whether Jesus is coming back to explain the Quran or not. If Jesus came back to explain the Quran, then Jesus is the messenger of the Quran and Muhammad is the prophet of the Quran. Thus, Muhammad wasn't the last messenger. He may have been the last prophet for those of you who want to believe in that. And the Quran is 1400 years old and has not changed the world or shaitan's power. And if the conditions of the world hasn't changed during or after the 1400 years that the Quran has been in existence, we need a new book. Even that word prophet has an industrial sound to it. Listen to the phonetics of the word prophet and prophet. And it seems like they are the only ones doing all of the profiting. You should ask yourself, why is this so? I'll tell you why, because they know something about you. They know that you are still suffering from an identity crisis in 1994 AD Islam has not changed anything in this world for the better. In fact, Islam helped create more death, war, hate and racism. And what if Muhammad was our last hope, then we might as well give up. Muhammad was only the last for those caught in a time trap. They know wherever we hear the word God, Allah, Om, Krishna or Krishna, anything that has to do with the spiritual world, wherever Negroes hear the word discipline, unity, prostration, prayer, fasting, sacrifices, wherever you hear those terms you can guarantee there is going to be some Negro sitting in there. And it doesn't matter which denomination it is. When the Hari Krishnas was on the street, Nubians were there with little black bunches of hair, little naturals. They couldn't get their little braid that they wear. When the Swamis, the Yogis and the Lamas came to America, you saw a whole bunch of Europeans that dropped out of college. Right along in that crowd were a couple of Negroes. 
Any place you go Negroes are trying to become a part of it even if it means selling out because you are still suffering from an identity crisis. If you haven't found who you want to be in 1994 AD, then you aren't going to find out. And if you don't believe me when I say Negroes want to be a part of something, Frederick Douglass was the teacher of the Ku Klux Klan. Do some research and you'll find this to be true. He was a lecturer for Europeans about blacks. He taught them about blacks and how to manipulate them. Frederick Douglass was a religious lecturer for Europeans, he was a Jesus type for them. All I'm trying to do is stir in you things you dare not question. And the way I can stir anything into you is to present the facts, historical facts, biological facts, archaeological facts, theological facts. I stir you to question the Bible and to question the Quran. That's what I'm here for. I'm not here to make Muhammad look good. I'm not here to make Moses look good. I'm not here to blaspheme Muhammad or Moses. I'm here to say is the Quran authentic or not? Because if it's not authentic then you do not need it. I am here to bring you nothing but the facts. Now, you may be willing to join the Masonic Lodge and sit around with them and know the doctrine is not authentic. Some man made it in the 14th century and 17th century and you feel that you belong to a brotherhood. And you feel quite content meeting on the last Thursdays of the month and shake hands and all that crap. However, I don't want that for my soul or my son's soul or my daughter's or my mother's or my brother's, who may be still out there in the wilderness. When you go back home now and sit with your family and you stand there in regular clothes, and they ask, what's the change? You say what change? What happened to all the white robes? Tell them you are following the example of Jesus. Jesus wore white robes up until it was time to shed those clothes. Jesus knew when to take them off. John 20 14 to 15. And when she had finished these things, she turned around and saw that it was Jesus standing there, and did not know that it was Jesus. Jesus said to her, Gune, confidant, wife, woman, why are you crying? Who are you looking for? She thought him to be the keeper of the garden. She said to him, He who is master, if you have carried him from here, just tell me where you have put him, and I will take him away. Then they ask, What do you mean? Then you will be able to gently massage them with the truth. They will say it is brainwashing. But that's exactly what they knew. They need to invest in a new shampoo called Brain Shampoo and that shampoo washes out the junk that's in your brain. Your brain needs to be washed of the dogma and the doctrine of the people who kept you blindly following. They were taking away your will and your mind. They take away the ability to do for yourselves, which makes us feel trapped within a vacuum of laws and discipline. Do you know by praying five times a day, how much time you have wasted? Do you realize that? Not just in Islam. In Christianity they have their own problem. There is not a person who converted from Christianity to Islam who didn't miss Christmas and Thanksgiving. Don't lie to me. So why torture your soul with that? Work yourself to the peace of your perfection. Find your way back to your destiny. That's why I say take that journey back inside. Find your way back to your destiny. You are Americans whether you want to accept it or not. Now if you don't like that and you don't like what America is doing then go on back to where you came from. Because you know you don't really want to go back to Africa, unless it's on a vacation going through Dar el Islam passing through Ethiopia, on through Egypt and back home on that flight. And when you come back to America, the first thing you go back to is American cooked food. Then you try to deal with the diarrhea from the bad water. But meanwhile you have United States of America. All these Egyptologists like Dr. Ben Jochanan who walk around and put pictures on walls from Egypt, you can live in an Egyptian country, learn to speak Arabic in two or three years at least in their dialect and be there when the Adan plays five times a day. Be there for the real Ramadan. I've been there for Ramadan, that's a whole other thing. It's worse than a Hitler camp over there. If you hate America so much then why are you and your Imam here? Because this is the land of opportunity, home of the brave, land of the free. Because you cannot in any other country step up on a college podium, or a minister's podium, and speak against the president, the prime minister or the king. They will dispatch people and they will arrest you and hang you and decapitate you anywhere else. Quran 533, Surely, the reward of those who fought for Allah, and the one he sent, Muhammad, and they hasten in the planet earth to cause mischief, to fight to kill, or crucify, or cut off their hands, and their legs, because of a difference, or they are expelled from the land. That is a shame in the physical world, and for them is a supreme pain in the end. Only in America can you talk about the president and call him all kinds of devils and names. You call the establishment the Antichrist or according to the Arabs the Dajjal, then you go taste the delicacy of this harlot called America, Revelation 18.3. You enjoy the freedom and liberty that America has to offer. This is the reason why the Haitians, the Cubans, the Chinese, Senegalese, and Arabs and a multiple of other nationalities are trying to come to America. 
However, while you're disrespecting her, you are waiting to see what's the next movie at the theater. All the things that are in movies, are images, and portrayals of all American propaganda. And your problem is, you don't realize what the advantages you have here in America like freedom of speech, whereas the rest of the people all over parts of the world whose governments don't do anything for them or care nothing about these who are suffering in countries such as Ethiopia, Somalia, South Africa, India, Korea, Haiti, Vietnam just to name a few. I'm not telling you to forget about what has happened to you in the 60s or what happened to our ancestors over the 4B past 400 years. You never forget those things because it is a part of your history and life forever. And because it is a part of your history, you should definitely teach your children about Nubian history. However, it is just as important for you to teach them to learn from the mistakes that were made in the past. Teach them to take advantage, to partake of the American dream. The fact is we are Americanized. You just don't know how to use it. Your clothes are cowboy clothes. Nubians were the first ones to be called cowboy because the Nubians used to take care of the Europeans' cows. And we were already called boys. Thus you get the word cowboy. Out of every five people in the West, two were Mexicans, two were blacks and one was European and this is a historical fact. Do some research and you will find this to be the truth. If you do some reading and research, you'll find out about the Black West in books entitled The Black West and the Black, Red and Dead. The Europeans are saying, if the blacks had any sense, they would have organized themselves just like the people who went to Liberia and set up their own Liberia here in America. If we went back there and started transporting the gold from South Africa back home ourselves instead of South Africans worrying about the Dutch taking their gold, they should have been working with us, the black Americans. We should have been transporting the gold to the USA and they then could build South Africa themselves. That's what they're doing. They're transporting the gold. They're digging in the mines. What are they doing in South Africa? Building, but who is it for? They call them Afrikaners. The language they speak is Afrikaans which is a language developed from the Dutch spoken by the Boers who settled in South Africa in the 1600s. What does that mean? Do you think that's why they're actually mad? The South Africans were not interested in Nelson Mandela getting out of jail, not the Nubians there. Because when you have a whole country of millions of people, if they wanted one man out of jail they could have just ran over to the prison and took him out of jail. They were not interested in him. If the Dutch South African government gives them a little more wealth and comfort they'd feel quite well living under their rule just as the middle and upper class Negroes in America are quite comfortable living under American European rule. So don't try to tell me that I'm wrong. We are in America most born and raised in America speaking English. This has become your country. Whether or not Africa is your motherland. That same thing would apply to all the Europeans in America who are also immigrants. But I will not sit around another year blaming them because they did more with their time here than we did. Get up off your butts. Stop listening to miserable rejects like Farrakhan and the likes and do something for yourself and country. There is no way in the world Nelson Mandela was supposed to spend 27 years in jail unless they just didn't care. You have a whole country of people coming out of the mountains. If you do any studying on South Africa, you'll find out the same problem exists that existed right here in America with Nubians. Do you know what that is? The problem is your egos. Nubians tend to ego trip when they get in a position of authority and power. You are divided against yourselves. The Sunnis over here, the Nation of Islam over here, the Ansars over here, Yahweh Ben Yahweh over here, Ben Ami Carter is over there, the Pentecostals over here, the Jehovah's Witnesses over here, the Seven-day Adventists are over there. Then there are the Baptists and the Lutherans. And that's just in the religious sector. Then you have the various so-called black organizations such as, the NAACP, PUSH, CORE. And then you have the Rainbow Coalition. All of these fake leaders are ego-tripping. That is why in South Africa you have the Communist Party, you have the Zulu Party and many others that are all ego-tripping. There is so much division, and no, you are not blaming it on the white man because no white man made you hate each other. If you're going to be Muslims then be Sudanese or be Hausa or be Somalians, or be Ethiopians or be Kenyans. But no, you want to be a Pakistanian. Look at yourself. You don't look anything like a Pakistanian. But you still want to go to Pakistan and be racially abused. Why are you going to bring me somewhere, where I'm going to be racially different and abused again? I don't care if you Negro Sunni Muslims can walk around here in America with Palestinian bandaloons or pants, shave your mustaches, try to look the part, twist your tongue with a extra roll. You are still a Negro in Pakistani clothes. Not only are you a Negro in Pakistani clothes, but a Zinji which is like saying the N-word in English. 
you are still seen as an American Negro in Pakistani and close to them. You can learn their language. You can go to Pakistan. You can marry a Pakistani woman and have a foreign wife. But you will always be the Negro American who converted to Islam and married a Pakistani. And this is just the kind of racism that you blame the KKK for. You'll make a big deal out of it when it's done to you here in America. However, when one of your Muslim brothers discriminate against you, you keep it silent. Racism is racism no matter how you look at. So I say to you, don't go pointing the finger here in America when you get the same harsh treatment in Pakistan. The same applies when you go in a Sunni Muslim mosque. You are an American Negro visiting their mosque. They want to know immediately whether or not you are a Farrakhan follower, a Wallace D. Muhammad follower, or of the Ansaru Allah community. But if a person from Lebanon walks in there or a person from Egypt walks in there or a person from Saudi Arabia walks in, he's immediately accepted as another Muslim, a real Muslim. You on the other hand, are always accepted as something fake or something converted. That's the real deal with all that crap. I say to you keep it. I was having the same racism with Islam that I was having in America. But the difference is America offers me more opportunities. So I repeat, stop wrestling with America on behalf of a bunch of people who don't care anything about you, yet call you their Muslim brother and they come to America to live the American dream. I don't need it. Keep it. And the same thing applies to the Africa movement organizations and to Egyptology. The Italians have their Italian parades and they bring out their dress and they do their little thing and it's cute. The Chinese people dress up for their parades and events. The only difference is everyone else has enough sense to take the costume off, because the word costume really means custom. Take off the custom and go to work. But no, not blacks. You all have to overdo it. You walk around with an oversized onk, an oversized crescent etc. All of this for what? Just to say you belong to something. All of this just to say to make a statement to people, I am a whatever, as big as the symbol is, you're supposed to see what I am. Nubians are the only ones who have to learn the hard way. Yes, you can have in your wedding ceremony, Egyptian clothes, in your prayer ceremonies, Egyptian clothes or Sumerian clothes etc. There isn't anything wrong with putting on your traditional garbs. But on a daily basis, when you are dealing with people, what sense does it make to walk down the street for a person to say what's that? Why should I set myself up for that? And if it's for attention, then you can best believe that it will be negative attention because no one wants you to come in their store if you look like you are straight out of the jungle. If you are honest, you as a black person feel the same way. When you see another black person walking down the street who is dressed ridiculously, you are afraid. What if you have to go to the hospital to take care of a baby? You have to worry about a person looking at you saying, so what are you? Listen you, take care of the baby. Forget about my costume. These are my customs, but they will say but what are you? What do you do? He's trying to fill out the application to get in the hospital, and he'll say what are you a black Muslim or something? I guess you want a kosher diet, you want to be in the no white folks section or something, what is it? Why would you put yourself through that? And the baby or the person who's ill through that while you are playing stupid games that most end up dropping out of after 10 years anyway? Most of the Sunni Muslims are walking around cursing us out and hating us and they are out drinking and smoking again. They left the fold of Islam and Allah and everything. However, while they were saying assalamu alaikum brother, they were fired, up or high on drugs. You have to show the younger people that we love them by not subjecting them to the mental imprisonment that we put ourselves through. We sacrificed as Ansars to get to the point we are now. That's what I've been saying for years. You are not going to have these kids walking around here in veils. Because of the day and time we are living in, it is too dangerous. Not to mention that you deprive the kids of their right to freedom. We can release the pressure off the kids. Don't deprive them of the festivities of the country they are in. You can try to keep that fanatical, anti-everything attitude by saying Christmas is about Nimrod and Babylonian. That's not why you're exempt. How many people knew that before we or the plain truth or the Jehovah's Witnesses mentioned it? The only thing you knew was, family came together, children got gifts, and that some guy is going to come through the chimney. You didn't care whether they were white or black. All you knew is that he was giving you something. He was giving you free gifts. It was joyful and everyone would be singing. When it was Thanksgiving you knew it was a turkey made and you went to a football game and you went ice skating or whatever you did. You came home waiting for the stuffing and the cranberry sauce, white and apple cider. All of that is beautiful if it makes you happy. And all of this is a part of American customs. But, way in the back of your mind when the song Silent Night came on, it was still a nice song. 
at least the people in the African culture had enough sense to go on and cheat and say Kwanzaa and put it in the days from Christmas to New Year's Day so they can justify and call it an African holiday and stuff it off. Meanwhile they are still celebrating Christmas. And we were standing on the other side talking about I couldn't miss Ramadan. When in actuality we wanted to say could you eliminate the 30 days of starving and just deal with Lid El Fatir with the gifts. I'm not depriving the kids of that, not because of the word Christmas in Babylonia. I'm not depriving them of the joy of a Christmas or the joys of a new year or the joy of Thanksgiving, or the joys of Easter because of some book that we now realize was copied out of the Enuma Elish anyway. The holidays are the best time of the year. Give it any name you feel like just keep the kids happy and give the kids gifts. Let's prepare and get the kids educated properly in the country they're in. It's all right to learn Arabic, Hebrew, Aramic or Syriac. However, it is more important to know the language of the country you're in and know it well. And I mean proper English not slang or broken English. Make sure the kids learn correct English and your kids are getting educated properly. Make sure the children are getting a well-rounded education. And that they are exposed to different cultures which will help them become a well-rounded person because I'm going to tell a secret of mine. For years, the one thing I've always done I wrote a lot of things in the book that were not necessary and they were science and they were biology and they were geography. You might not understand why I wrote a whole book on anatomy. I did that because I saw that somewhere along the line a lot of young kids were listening to me as a leader. They were dropouts and misfits to society and weren't reading anything and weren't doing anything. I had the young crowd listening. Then something dawned on me. I said I have a responsibility not only to teach this Ansar fanatical doctrine. I had to figure out a way to weave in things they will need in their everyday lives. That's why sometimes I might seem like I over elaborate on science, astronomy, anthropology, geography, and the likes. I might explain latitude and longitude because I'm educating you on how to read maps. I might be talking about blood and talk about the circulatory system versus the respiratory system. I'm just trying to teach them about the anatomy of their human body. And that was my way. To this very day I'm teaching you astronomy and a lot of things. I just cut straight through and go directly to the facts. Now I'm sending you to libraries to learn and research, to learn about the planets, to learn about Mars and Jupiter and Saturn. Some of you are going to the library and reading about the missiles. I want you to read about the Voyagers 1 and 2 and find out about when and why they went into outer space. I'm talking about the economic situation and how the President of the United States, Bill Clinton, is trying to solve it. You're going to turn on the news and start listening. When he starts talking you're going to hear what he's starting to say and you're going to see the changes taking place. You will know why there are floods and all these earthquakes, and why they are all taking place now. I'm trying to raise you spiritually. I'm also trying to give you an education that you won't get on the streets. I'm not just going to sit around and tell you that all white people are the devil and all black people are angels because it simply is not true. I'm tired of the stupid game because that is not taking the Nubian race anywhere. What Nubians need to do is produce some lawyers and some doctors and above that, some scientists. We need to be in NASA. That's the reality. Because if you're on the outside of reality you can walk and live in the world a non-realistic world and don't face what's taking place in front of you every day for what they call from sun up to sun down and that's real. You're not a part of mainstream because you stepped out of reality. I'm trying to take the Nubian nation back into reality. And then the adults can make sure the next generation of kids will get properly educated so they will become effective. My personal belief is my business whether I'm a mason or a shriner or elk or knight of Columbus. The focus is on the children and providing them with a better environment. I'm not going to deprive the kids of going to Disney World or Six Flags. We all as adults have to get together and make it happen. We just can't live like that. We can't deprive ourselves by walking around with the black thing attitude. The only thing that we are doing is depriving ourselves and our children, and mainly our children of some of the better things in life. We have some of the better things in life. We have to take this film off our eyes and get back into mainstream and then we will see how effective our doctrine's teachings are. As long as we were standing on the outskirts patting each other on the back and flattering each other, we didn't know what was going on. So I asked the question again, does religion breed ignorance? The answer is definitely yes. Because religion makes you ignore all of the scientific, astrological and archaeological facts that are undisputable and because of this ignorance there is racism. Because you are constantly ignoring the facts for a fictitious place called heaven and this is what I mean by ignorance. Prior to this book and the many other books that are published by the Holy Tabernacle Ministries, you ignored the facts which were there all along. You were to blind to see them. And because the spell is being lifted you will be able to see many of the traps that you have fallen victim to all of these years. The biggest one called religion. The beginning.